when you're looking into the way of policy. You go back to the magic grid. Example, in this person, the magic grid is low. The programming time is 10.8 seconds. The activated plasma tombo and plasma time is this. That's a uh, low. And blade count is very high. And uh, when you have a blade count that is high, it's also something that can lead to tone process. So the question is, what are the signs and symptoms that are, that are suggesting to Mr. Ellen that he has deep venous thrombosis? And as Ellen may have uh, identified that, mainly there is a progressive swelling and soreness of the right calf. That's what we, that's what we see mainly. And then, what would be the management strategy? And that's what we go into in this part of the lecture. Now, the next slide is one of the ones I told you to review. Now, what we believe that you will do this, but this is nothing but the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade is very important when it comes to uh, thromboembolism. And it starts off with uh, factor 12, then factor 12 becomes activated, it becomes, when it becomes activated, that's why you put the letter A to it. Then it is that, and that goes on to activate factor 11. 11 becomes activated, and then it activates factor 9, factor 9 becomes activated, it now activates factor 10, A, and all as the case may be. That's is your cascade, that is your coagulation cascade. And at the end of the coagulation is the formation of a thrombin. Thrombin is the major enzyme of coagulation. So when we're treating anticoagulant, we will treat agents that attack thrombin as a means of inhibiting coagulation. So this thrombin, when it is eventually formed, uh, we're going to stabilize, uh, we're going to activate factor 12. So, uh, activated factor 12 is the one that now works on fibrin. When the fibrin is formed, it's usually formed from fibrinogen. And it needs the presence of calcium ions for fibrinogen to, uh, to be converted to a fibrin gel. Gel is not your typical clot. It's a gel which means it's soft like, solid, semi solid. But when thrombin acts on factor 12, the activated factor, um, not factor 12, sorry, factor 13, the activated factor 13 will now stabilize that fibrin gel and become a stable fibrin clot. And this is the one that causes the problem. Of course, you need uh, a clot to be formed under physiologic conditions as well as pathologic conditions. For example, physiologic, when, when you have a wound, let's say you strike yourself with a pin or with a cup and you see some bleeding. Hmm? What you see later on is a cup that is coming there. So you need that. That's physiologic one. Because it's happening outside the body. The pathologic one is the cup that is forming right within the system. That's the one you now want. Now, the body is so great and um, such that when this fibrin clot is formed, it does not stay in the, as a clot. Because if it does, then there's a problem. So there's a process we call fibrinolysis, which breaking down fibrin. So that in itself helps to arrest excessive clot formation. And when I treat the anti thrombotic agent in the uh, peripheral artery disease and stroke, we will talk about fibrinolytic agents that you can use in the management of uh, that thrombotic uh, event, that situation. Now, this next slide talks about the general principles. One, with respect to blood formation, there's a normal one. The normal one is the one I'm telling you that when you have. Uh, is cut on your skin and all that. That's a physiologic one. And uh, that is the one that helps to maintain the integrity of the uh, vasculature. And you call it hemostasis. Hemostasis means arrest of 
reason. Stasis is stoppage, in most of the liquid stoppage. Pathologic one is the thrombosis, which is the one I've been telling you about. Now, when you now have a thrombus and an embolus, there are these abnormal thrombotic effects, which are your pathologic uh, effects. The one is a deep venous thrombosis, and they have pulmonary embolism. And pulmonary, uh, pulmonary embolism happens to be the primary complication of DVT. Because once the clot is formed and gets to the heart, the next place it's going is the lung. So because it goes to the lung, that is where you find the primary, the primary complication of DVT. That's called a pulmonary embolism. Of course, if it goes to the, uh, to the brain, you have cerebral vascular accidents which is stroke, and then you can have heart attack. These are the, these are your abnormal thrombotic events. So when you have to treat these thrombotic events, there are the general principles. One, you can use anticoagulants, because of what I can explain, because coagulation is what allows the clots to be formed. And because platelets are always needed even in the formation of the clot, the platelets will clump together, they will aggregate and form a mass and help in the process of the thrombus formation. You have to use antiplatelet agents. And because of uh, the fibrinolysis, you need the fibrinolytic agents, or what we call thrombolytic agents, to make sure that they break down the fibrin so that the fibrin does not become unnecessarily stable, as you saw in that slide. So and what are the goals of treatment when we do when we do better of this one? The one the first one is that you want to prevent the pathological clot formation in those patients that are at risk. Who are the patients that are at risk? Of these patients, those ones who are on a prolonged bed rest, or those ones who are about to embark on a journey and it's going to be a long journey. We want to prevent the formation of the clot in those individuals. And then we also want to now prevent the clot extension. Let's say, for some reason, you are not able to prevent the clot being formed. You should be able to prevent the extension of the clot. Means you do not want the embolization that will occur because there's an established problem. Now, when it comes to looking at the uh, etiology of thromboembolism or the risk factors in thromboembolism, there are three primary factors. One, I started, uh, this is abnormalities of blood flow. And when I started this class, the first thing I mentioned to you is the importance of a continuous blood flow. So if the blood is not flowing continuously, then it causes venous stasis. And it's that venous stasis that gives rise to DVT, that now gives rise to pulmonary embolism, which is the primary complication of DVT. And how can venous stasis occur? It can come from stasis of blood even within the heart itself. And when there is a stasis of blood within the heart, all that means is that the heart is not pushing out all the blood is supposed to push out, so it's staying there. And that can lead to embolization, can lead to stroke. Now, what are the examples of this case? Atrial fibrillation. When the atria are undergoing fibrillation, they do not have enough time to pass on impulses completely to the ventricles so that the ventricles can invariably push blood out of the system so the blood stays there. It has left ventricular dysfunction. That's obvious because the left ventricles will not be able to push out blood. And the left ventricular dysfunction can be due to congestive heart failure, can be due to myocardial ischemia, can be due to ischemic cardiomyopathy, and there can also be venous obstruction. One of the problems around to when people have tumors in certain organs is that the tumors get large enough that they now start occluding the brain, so it can cause uh, venous obstruction. 
obesity can cause renal function, pregnancy can cause renal function. That's the first risk factor. The second risk factor would be when you have abnormalities of the blood vessel work. I talked about the endothelium before. Endothelium is that thin layer of blood vessels that allows you to maintain normal health of the blood vessel. The beauty of the blood vessel is when the endothelium is intact, no injury, nothing. But when there's injury to the blood vessel wall, it creates a problem because it becomes a site for the formation of erythroblasts. So um, the same thing is seen in people that replace artificial heart valves. So when you put heart valves, there's no way it will not rub up on the endothelium, so it can cause abnormality here and there. And what are examples of um, abnormalities of blood vessel uh, injuries that can arise in blood vessels when there's acute myocardial uh, myocardia infarction, when there's atherosclerosis, when there's disease of the heart valve, or when you are replacing heart valves, or any individuals that have had a previous DVT and those who have had vascular injury. The last primary factor is uh, hypercoagulability. We're talking about coagulation as a, an important component of thrombosis. So if we have a situation where the blood is just hypercoagulated, it might be because of excessive production of clotting factor. Or it will also come from an insufficient production of anti-clotting factors. See, if there is clotting, for a proper working system in the body, there should be enough of anti-clotting methods to balance things up. So when you have hypercoagulability, maybe that you have too many coagulation factors, or you have too little of the anti-coagulation mechanism, so that it throws it up. So what can happen in this case is that you have some natural anticoagulants, and those anticoagulants can be anti-trophy 3, protein C, etc. You will see that in the next slide. But the other things that can cause hypercoagulability is uh, individuals are on estrogen therapy, uh, like contraceptives or those ones who are using estrogen therapy for certain tumors, homocystinemia, polycythemia, uh, pregnancy, dysphagnogenemia, all those can constitute changes in coagulability. Now, these are the natural inhibitors of clotting mechanism. So it means a reduced level of any of these can bring about an excessive coagulation because the check and balance is not enough. Okay, the first one is antithrombin. And antithrombin will uh, target factors 2, 9, and 10. And I will come to that like to explain that a little more. There's protein S and there's protein C. Protein S and protein C, they go together. Protein S is a cofactor for protein C. And protein C will inactivate factors 5 and 8. Now you have tissue, fa uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Tissue factor is one of the uh, one of the coagulation factors, and I think that's what it is. So here, this is where you see tissue factor being a coagulation factor. That's factor seven. So it has its own tissue factor pathway inhibitor that tends to antagonize it here to here. Just like you have a thrombin, you have antithrombin. That's what I'm trying to explain there. So let's go to the others. And then you have plasminogen. Plasminogen is a, is a substrate for plasmids. And when you have plasminogen, you have an end that you call plasminogen activator. It means if you activate plasminogen, the plasmid. That plasmid is the major enzyme of fibrinolysis. Just like thrombin is the major enzyme of coagulation, 
plus me is the major and then of five reverse. And what it does is it helps to degrade fibrin. It helps to lyse fibrin. That's why we call it capitalistic factor. Now, when we look at the uh, different <coughs> inhibitors of coagulation that I mentioned in this, in the previous slide, you have antithrombin 3. Antithrombin 3 is here. So it's targeting thrombin naturally. It's targeting factor 10 and it's targeting factor 9. So if I were to ask you what are the targets of uh, antithrombin 3, you need to let me know it's 2, 9, and 10. Okay? So these are the natural anticoagulants to this specific anticoagulant. And for protein C slash S, you know protein C is a cofactor for protein S. No, S is the cofactor for C. So for this one, it targets two of these clotting factors. Factor 5 and factor 7. Factor 5 and factor 7. Because the tissue factor pathway inhibitor we target here. I don't have that on this slide, but you can have that on your slide. This is where the tissue factor pathway inhibitor will be targeting that as a means of inhibiting coagulation. Let's quickly go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about the clotting cascade. I've told you the cascade has a clot formation, of course, when you have damage to the endothelium, what happens, what happens. When they are damaged to the endothelium, that, that, that damaged site becomes a foreign surface. And there's nothing platelets like but a foreign surface. Once they see that foreign surface, they just start to uh, get attracted to that site. So the first thing that will happen is platelets will adhere to that site. Upon addition, then they get activated. And when they get activated, they aggregate. They aggregate. So, and for these processes to occur for platelets, it needs the following uh, substances. It needs the von Willebrand factor. It needs the GP1 receptor. GP just refers to glycoprotein. Just know it as it's a glycoprotein 1 receptor. Then, the platelet will release its products. And what are the products from uh, platelet? ADP, from boxing A2. And the aggregation of platelet also needs the GP2B3A receptor. All of these, don't worry uh, too much about them. When I come to a stroke, I will come to peripheral artery disease and all that. We will talk more about each of these ones as targets of action and targets of therapy for thrombotic events in that has involved platelets. Now let's look at the two types of pathological thrombi. It can occur in the veins or it can occur in the arteries. If it occurs in the arteries, you will know that you then have an arterial thrombus and the arterial thrombus will be composed mainly of platelets and fibers, platelets and fibers, but there will be occasional white blood cells. And because we are talking about arteries, this can only occur in areas of rapid blood flow because you know in the arteries, blood flows rapidly, much more rapidly than you have in the veins. So, and then what causes it to occur? It is the rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque in an artery that brings about an arterial thrombus. This is opposed to venous thrombus, which is composed mainly of fibrin and red blood cells, and only a tiny bit of platelet head. And because we're talking of veins, this occurs in areas of sluggish or no blood flow at all. So if you think back to 
what I've been telling you about prolonged bed rest or immobilization and all that, then you know that is when you have peanuts thrown by occurring in areas of sluggish blood flow. And this, once you form a response to venous stasis or vascular injury after surgery or, tra or trauma. So when you now have to treat this uh, pathological trauma, it depends on what type it is. So if you have an arterial trauma, because it's composed mainly of platelets, then you have to use anti-platelet agent. And that's when I come to stroke, I come to peripheral artery disease and coronary artery disease, we're going to talk much more details. But know that we'll be talking more about anti-platelet primary at that point. Now, when you have um, venous thrombus, then that is when you use anticoagulant because it's composed mainly of fibrin, and you know fibrin is the main product of coagulation. Then there are situations where you can have mixed arterial and venous thrombus. In that case, that's why we go for thrombolytic agents. We go for thrombolytic agents. So moving on, let me see whether you may with me so far. A. Arterial thrombi are composed mainly of fibrin and red blood cells. True or false? Okay. B. Antiplatelet agents are the primary agents for the treatment of venous thrombi. False. False. What answers on the back? False. Because I had more chorus in number eight, so when you go to B, I, I, I want to be sure that you're following me so I can go back. All right, then C, the clotting factor target for protein CS is activated factor five. It is true. It is true. It is true. Are we good? Are we good about that? It is good. The clotting factor target for anti thrombin three is activated factor five. False. Hmm? False. 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 Very good. So you pretty much are with me. Let me see when I will lose it. <laughs> now, risk factors for thromboembolism include all of these, except is pregnancy a risk factor for thromboembolism? Yes. yes. Hypertension a risk factor for thromboembolism? Mm -hmm. Is hypertension a risk factor? Huh? Yes, true, true, true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know hypertension is the bad boy. But uh, almost everything everybody says is hypertension, hypertension. Sorry, hypertension is not a risk factor for trauma and It's not a risk factor. So that's not true. What about atherosclerosis? Yes. So what about tumor? Yes. How about vascular injury? Yes. How about the efficiency of anti thrombin Yes. The efficiency of anti thrombin Do you know what anti thrombin trick do us? Do you know what it does? It balances out, okay? So if I die, thrombin is supposed to balance thrombin, and thrombin is the main enzyme of coagulation. So if you have too much of thrombin, or if you have too little of anti thrombin, then that is a risk factor. So when you have deficiency of any of the natural inhibitors of coagulation, that is a risk factor. Get it now. Hmm? We're talking about the balance. Okay, so let's now go quickly into the next thing as we discuss the pharmacology of antithrombotic agents. And for today, I'll be treating heparin and low molecular weight heparin. We're treating warfarin. We're treating those ones that we call selective factor 10A inhibitors. I'll be treating the red thrombin inhibitors. 
So help me God. <laughs> and today we'll be covering all of these drugs, and I want you to make um, make a change in your in your look. This last three have uh, been newly approved. So they are now being added to your top 300 list of drugs. They are now added as of uh, between last year and now, they are now part of the drugs. They have now been accepted by FDA for the, for the management of drugs. Okay. So when we get to the closing cascade again, and I'm starting with heparin, the targets of heparin are the ones that are put in red. And they are all the ones in circles. They are the ones in circles. So what are the quarantine factors that heparin target as an anticoagulant? Factor two, factor 10, Factor 9, factor 11, and 12. So I just want to say it's 2, 9, 10, 11, 12. Factors 2, 9, 10, 11, 12. Those are the targets of heparin. And any, uh, any heparin for that matter, whether it's a low molecular weight or it's a standard heparin, would do that. So let's start with heparin. The standard heparin is an unfractionated heparin. This is a big size molecule, and uh, Dr. Kelly actually mentioned that to you tomorrow. And it's an heterogeneous mixture of glycosamino glycans that have varying molecular weights. It can be obtained from bovine lung or from pig intestinal mucosa. What's the mechanism of action of this heparin? It binds to antithrombin 3. It binds to antithrombin 3. And uh, let me go to the next slide. Why we have this. In this situation, you have here the heparin is bound to thrombin, uh, no, to antithrombin. This is thrombin. Uh, factor 2, which heparin targets? <coughs> when heparin needs to target thrombin, it does it indirectly by binding to anti thrombin 3. You see, the activity of heparin or its ability to antagonize a thrombin is not great until there's been a conformational change in this binding. So when heparin now binds to antithrombin, it now accelerates the activity of antithrombin so that the antithrombin can now bind into the active site of thrombin. Don't forget, thrombin is the main enzyme of coagulation, and that is the one that heparin targets but he does it through antithrombin. Naturally, without antithrombin, the effect is very weak. But once it binds to antithrombin, there is a conformational change this, that allows the antithrombin to now bind to fight, uh, to bind the thrombin. There are two types of thrombin. There is the soluble thrombin, and there is the fibrin bound thrombin. So with the heparin, it can only bind to soluble thrombin. It does not have the ability to bind to fibrin bound thrombin. So it appears that the presence of fibrin on the thrombin is a discouragement for the action of heparin. So heparin binds only to soluble thrombin, not to fibrin bound thrombin. So, uh, when the heparin binds to the anti-thrombin 3, it forms a complex, and that complex is the one that now carries out the irreversible inactivation of those factors I mentioned to you. Two, 
12. What are the effects produced by heparin? Anticoagulation, of course. It will inhibit platelet function and it will increase vascular permeability. And heparin can be administered intravenously or subcutaneously. And anytime you use heparin, you have to monitor for the effectiveness of anticoagulation. And how do you do that? You have to monitor activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT. That is the way to adjust the dose of heparin. It must be done any time that you're poisoning a patient on uh, heparin. Mention that heparin, the standard heparin, is a huge molecule of very molecular weight. It's repeating functions of the glycosaminoglycan. Then we now have low molecular weight heparin. As the name suggests, they have low molecular weight, much lower than heparin. And how do you produce the low molecular weight heparin? It's by chemical or enzymatic degradation or depolymerization of uh, the unfractionated heparin. UFH there, I mean unfractionated heparin. What are the examples of low molecular weight heparin? Daltepharin, <coughs> enozaparin, tinzaparin, etc. This low molecular weight heparin differ from each other in terms of their molecular weight because they have different molecular weight. And they have a different activity in terms of targeting factor 10 as opposed to factor 2. So when you go back to the factors that heparin target, you have factor 2, you have factor 9, 10, 11, 12. So in order to assess the activity, we look at their ability to target factor 10 as opposed to factor 2. And the table I have below will explain that much more. Now, how are the low molecular weight heparin different from unfractionated one? Because the first one is in terms of molecular weight. The second one is in terms of antithrombotic property. The low molecular weight heparins are more and more effective than standard heparin as an antithrombotic agent. Then in terms of pharmacokinetics, they have very favorable pharmacokinetic profile in terms of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And in terms of adverse effects, they have lower, uh, much minimal adverse effects. And then, last but not the least, is in terms of monitoring requirements. You see, for heparin, you must monitor ATTT. For the low molecular weight heparins, you don't have to. So that's an advantage when you use them. So let's now compare, according to this table, between heparin and uh, low molecular weight heparin. But I've included a selective factor 10A inhibitor that's from the Parinox, just to complete the comparison. So if you look at the ability to antagonize factor 10 uh, as a ratio of ability to uh, attack factor two for heparin is one to one. If it blocks factor 10A at 10%, it does the same thing, 10% to factor two. Whereas for the low molecular weight heparins, they are much more effective in antagonizing factor 10 than they do to factor two. You could see it could go from two to one to four to one. And if you look at the selective factor 10A inhibitor, it makes sense. That's 100 to 1. That means the antagonized factor of 10 is 100 times, 100 fold, compared to uh, attacking factor 2. And that's what makes them selective factor 10 a inhibitor. Then when it comes to monitoring of uh, APTT, uh, it is required for heparin, but not for the other two. And when you uh, give heparin, the APTT is increased. 
with, uh, with heparin, but not with low molecular weight heparin or with uh, the vandaparin. With vascular permeability, heparin increases it, whereas neither low molecular weight heparin or vandaparin uh, exert any effect on vascular permeability. With respect to half life, the half life of heparin is 30 to 150 minutes. That of low molecular weight heparin is two to six hours. I've mentioned earlier on that there's an improved pharmacokinetic profile. That is how you know there's an improved pharmacokinetic profile. Heparin, 30 to 150 minutes. Low molecular weight heparin, two to six hours. I see for fondaparinums, a whopping 17 hours. Which means if you give fondaparinums today, you can calculate on the basis of pharmacokinetics how many half lives three and a half for which the effect could still be present in the body. Then with protein binding, it is saturable with the heparin and uh, it binds very well. Uh, elimination, uh, all of them are eliminated uh, via the kidney. That is the comparison slide as far as the heparins are concerned. So let's look at some other advantages of a low molecular weight heparin. Improved bioavailability, predictable dose response, and longer antithrombotic effect. That's what makes them superior to standard heparin. But what are the adverse effects? Well, thrombocytopenia, because they, can, they inhibit platelet function, so they will inhibit, uh, they will cause a reduction in a, a platelet count and that can lead to bleeding. Because with bleeding in the urine, in the blood, and the nose, everywhere, you have hematuria, hematopexia, hemoptysis, then you have melina, now. then you have osteoporosis, and there could be immunologic cross-reactivity and hypersensitivity reaction with heparin sometimes. And when you have to reverse the effect of uh, heparin, protamine, is an agent that is useful in reversing it. Because heparin is acidic, protamine is basically saccharine. So you can use acid-based neutralization uh, concept to take care of uh, excessive dose of heparin. A patient who had a major car accident was admitted for orthopedic surgery that will require prolonged immobilization post-operation. The choice has to be made between heparin, the bigger term, or enantiomerase. Which of these statements is correct? And when you see any stem like this, for example, don't be thrown up, because many of you just become different. It's just a way of uh, settling you down. Mm? So cool that, cool that. Because I don't think too hard, don't think too hard. All of this is, as we just have said, uh, concerning heparin, the bigger channel, and exoparin, which of these statements is correct. But I just want to throw some fluff for you. OK, so does heparin inactivate factors 7 and 10? No. No. 10 is correct, right? Yes. But not seven. Very good. And has a longer half life than from the parinox. Oh. Very good. We are all very awake today. Good. All right. Before you start sleeping on me, I will. Uh, you're not sleeping, no? No. Okay. I want to make sure you're not sleeping. All right now. Okay. Let's go to warfarin. Warfarin is the next group of antagonists. And uh, warfarin, if you, as the arrows show, the target, the clotting factors that are targeted by warfarin are the ones identified in boxing. And those should be factors two, seven, nine, and 10. Two, seven, nine, and 10. As opposed to that of uh, heparin. Now, what you know about warfarin See, unlike heparin, warfarin is orally effective. Heparin is not. And 
this one has a delayed onset of action, a whopping five to seven days, as opposed to peppering that would just be matters of minutes and hours. What's the mechanism of action of warfarin? It acts as a vitamin K antagonist. Anytime you have vitamin K deficiency, then warfarin, you need to be careful in terms of dosing with warfarin because it's a vitamin K antagonist and already the patient has vitamin K deficiency. So what really does it do is because uh, it does define antagonist. So antagonizing vitamin K, it causes the reduction of the synthesis of clotting factors that depend on vitamin K. And what are these vitamin K dependent clotting factors? They're the same as factors 2, factors 7, factors 9, and 10. And on the other hand, uh, or in addition, is the fact that protein C and S are related to warfarin. And so, warfarin also affects their, uh, their activity. And don't forget, protein CNS are natural inhibitors of coagulation. So, heparin does not have anything to do with protein CNS. In case you get that question from me, it has nothing to do with protein CNS. It's warfarin that has things to do with protein C. And S. Let's now see exactly how it does it. See, in this, um, in the scheme of things, the vitamin K cycle, there are these coagulation factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10. They are naturally inactive, and they have glutamic residues on them. And then the Fertelia will tell you more. That, that tomorrow. But for them to be active, they have to undergo a process of carboxylation. So when they are carboxylated, they now carry a carboxy glutamate residue. That is when this function, this is when they become activated. And that's when they can bring about coagulation. Okay, let me go over that again. They are in their natural state, they carry glutamate residues, but they are inactive. When they are activated, it is because there's a carboxy group that is added to it, so they become carboxy glutamate residues. That's when they are active. And how does vitamin K come in? Vitamin K has a cycle. And anytime you talk about the cycle, that is, it's a cycle between the reduced form and the active form. Reduced form and active form. Reduced form and active form. Now, when vitamin K is in the reduced form, that is when it is active. It is now able to bring about that carboxylation process. So, the cycle is going on, the reduced form is formed, uh, the reduced form uh, shows up in the, in the system. Carboxylation of glutamate residues occur and you have coagulation. Now, when and the enzyme that makes that is involved in the conversion of the oxidized form of vitamin K to the reduced form, we call it epoxide reductase. So, epoxide reductase being a reductase will convert the oxidized form to the reduced form. The oxidized form is inactive. The reduced form is active. It is the reduced form that allows coagulation to occur. So what does warfarin do? Warfarin blocks epoxide reductase so that it keeps the vitamin K in its oxidized but inactive form. So it does not allow the reduced form to, uh, to occur. So there's no carboxylation, therefore there's no coagulation. That is all this slide is telling you. Okay. So you said the epoxy, epoxy side is right? Epoxide uh -huh. is what is happening? That's what it by inhibiting mm -hmm. the epoxide reductase. So 
the reductase is not able to. Okay. Get it? Okay, so what are the properties of warfarin? It is, its absorption from the GIT is rapid and complete, almost 100% absorption. And that's why it is given orally. Peak absorption is in about 60 to 120 minutes. And it is 99% bound to plasma protein, especially albumin. Warfarin is bound to albumin, not to adrenaline thrombin. And when you have to do a laboratory test for warfarin, as opposed to APTT that you do for uh, heparin, you do PT for warfarin. What are the adverse effects of warfarin? Thrombocytopenia. So it can cause hemorrhage into many tissues. It can cause skin necrosis. It can cause fetal toxicity. And therefore, you avoid using it. Pregnancy. Now, one of the most important adverse effects is that it has a significant drug interaction. Significant drug interaction. When there's overdose of warfarin, what do you do? You give it vitamin K or fresh frozen plasma. Vitamin K or fresh frozen plasma. Now, these are the drug interactions that are important for warfarin. Like we say, to read the mechanism of action that they involved in some of them, and the examples of drugs that are at work. And I believe you can you can pretty much go through this um, easily. Um, and I know you've talked about enzyme inducers and enzyme inhibitors. For example, when you have enzyme inducers, this will uh, reduce the anticoagulant effect. And when you have enzyme inhibitors, it will increase the anticoagulant effect. I know you mentioned, and you continue to hear about cytochrome uh, P450 enzyme inhibitors and enzyme inducers, they will do that. Um, what are the other things? It is strongly protein, it's strongly bound to protein, about 99%. So it will interact heavily with other drugs that are uh, protein bound. Then it becomes a question of displacement. If uh, this is a one that's stronger is able to displace it or the other one, that brings about a lot of drug interaction. And on the basis of protein binding alone, you know, because you know many drugs are bound to protein, warfarin is going to play a central role because it's 99% bound. So it has the ability to just displace the lesser bound drug from the binding site in uh, on protein. The next slide talks about the direct thrombin inhibitors. Heparin, you will see it as an indirect thrombin inhibitor because it works through anti-thrombin. But then you have those ones that work directly on thrombin. And we call them direct thrombin inhibitors. Examples are the bigatran, agatrophan, the pyridine, and bivalirudin. When do these ones become useful? It's usually when there is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. You want to avoid that effect, so you go for the direct thrombin inhibitor. The use, when you, like, when you give them, they will have lesser complications in terms of hemorrhage. So all those adverse effects are listed for heparin are not as, uh, not as great and not as bad when it comes to the direct thrombin inhibitors. What are their properties? You can give them by continuous infusion. You can give them orally because we're still talking about direct thrombin inhibition. Then you've got to monitor APTT when you give them. Uh, some of them are antigenic, like pyridine and bivalirudine. They will generate what we call uh, anti-pyridine antibodies, and they can be eliminated in the kidney or the liver, depending on which of them. The pyridine and bivalirudine in the kidney and the liver will be the site of elimination for agatrova. Now, how do the, the retrobate inhibitors work? This is their own mechanism. 
say, if you look at this other side of the graph, this is your univalent molecule. And this is the thrombin. Now, this does not need to be attached to any other type of formula like an anti-thrombin dog with heparin. So the molecule attaches straight to the active site of thrombin. And that's why you call it the red thrombin inhibitor. And whether it's univalent or divalent, it's able to bind either directly to the active site or to bind to the two sites, which we call exocytes of the enzyme. But the important thing at the end of the day is that it is able to bind to the active site of the enzyme. And it can bind both to soluble thrombin as well as to fibrin bound thrombin. It's only heparin that makes that distinction that cannot bind to fibrin bound thrombin. The direct thrombin inhibitors, because it's going directly, actually binds both the soluble and the fibrin bound, fibrin bound thrombin. That is what I'm showing there. This other slide now talks about indications for anticoagulant. And I put uh, that head in there for you to relate to the first, uh, the first few slides where we mentioned about the goals of treatment of uh, thrombotic events is to prevent the formation of a thrombus or to prevent the extension of a clot once it has been formed. So in this case, all anticoagulants, the all the ones I've mentioned now, are very useful and very effective in preventing formation and propagation of newly formed thrombus. It is it just occurring, it's about to occur, you can use uh, anticoagulants. But they are not effective against pre-existing thrombi. So if the patient has already developed a thrombi, that is not the time you go for anticoagulants. That's what I'm talking about. So please make a distinction as to when you can use anticoagulants as opposed to when you cannot use them. Now, what are the indications? If there's cardioembolic stroke, you can use anticoagulants. When there's left ventricular dysfunction, because it can lead, it's a risk factor for coagulation and thrombus, you can use anticoagulants. When there's DBT and PD, you can do that. When there's valvular disease, you can use anticoagulants. When you are replacing valves, especially with mechanical prosthetic valves, then you can use anticoagulants. They use it also to prevent cardiogenic thromboembolism in atrial fibrillation. So the atrial fibrillation, that is one of the ones that can cause venous stasis. Then the thromboembolism that arises from that, we call it cardiogenic because it's coming from the, from the heart. Then last but not the least, as an indication, is for the management of anticoagulation especially for dental proceedings. So if you're going to go to the, uh, to the dentist, an anticoagulant will definitely be given to you even before the surgery to try to prevent coagulation. So this last slide at the beginning compares heparin with warfarin. So when it comes to absorption, you know, heparin can only be given parenterally. You can give it IV or subcutaneously. Warfarin can only be given oral. You can give it parenterally. Elimination of heparin. You see the numbers there. Protein binding. You see that. Uh, therapeutic no, no, side effects. You got bleeding and thrombocytopenia and osteoporosis with heparin, and you have bleeding, skin necrosis, and drug interactions with warfarin. And when you have to treat bleeding, that comes from heparin, so you have to give protein 
and if you're going to take that of watering, you give fresh, uh, fresh plasma or vitamin K uh, replacement. And I want to believe that that is, the thing. this is a summary slide listing the agents that can be used in the treatment of thromboembolism, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, warfarin, direct thromboembolism inhibitor, and selective factor 10A inhibitor. This is where you have the portaparinox and some other one, the Pactiban, the Pactiban. All of these are new now and are available in the market. And so, let me uh, check where I am with you and tell me true or false. What range stimulates vitamin K epoxide reductase? True or false? <laughs> Where is it false? <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Okay. So, where in the exam? Then your test. And now put what for me inhibits. Don't tell me what you practice in class for stimulate. Just say what for me. Da, 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 da. No. <laughs> so, please read it carefully. Okay. Heparin is strongly bound to an albumin. False, huh? It is false. It is not bound to albumin. It is bound to what? It's bound to antithrombin. It's bound to antithrombin. Okay? B valuridin. What class does it belong to? B valuridin. Direct. Is it a direct drug inhibitor or selective factor 10A inhibitor? Direct. 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 It's a direct drug inhibitor. Okay, it can bind to and inhibit the activity of soluble thrombin and thrombin bound to fiber. Hmm? You just told me it's a direct thrombin inhibitor. So if it is true that it's a direct thrombin inhibitor, so shouldn't it be true? Huh? It can bind to both. Okay. Okay, that happens to be my last slide. Okay. Any question? Which one? Like Which one? Yeah. anti oh. They're not anti mm -hmm. They can cause bleeding mm -hmm. by antagonizing platelets. But they are anti-platelets. So hold the fire. <laughs> I'll give you my by the time I give you a lot of stuff. You tell me to reduce the number of drugs that we Yes, we <laughs> Okay, so if there are no more questions, I am done. Where is your attendance sheet? I need to have the attendance sheet. Um, we were, uh, some people are online. Katia, 